Today we're looking at the Beatitudes of Matthew chapter 5 and the woes of Matthew chapter 23. And we look at mercy obtained or omitted. There's a Jewish tradition that says that after the fall of Adam and Eve, God sent two angels down to earth, one named Judgment and the other named Mercy. Together they perform an office on the sinning human race. When judgment afflicts, mercy heals. When judgment makes a rent, then mercy plants a flower. When judgment carves out a wrinkle, then mercy kindles a smile. When judgment produces a storm, a scrowling storm, and spreads the rain, then mercy spreads the rainbow. Where one poses a glittering sword, the other covers the naked head with suckering wing. Mercy and judgment. We see them in these these verses of our text today. Mercy in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 7 where it says, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. And then we see judgment in Matthew 23, 23 and 24 where it says, Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and anus and cumin, but have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These you ought to have done not to leave the others undone. You are blind guides which strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. And then there's another text found back in the Psalms which puts these two together in perspective so we can apply it in our life, and that is Psalm 41, verse 1. Blessed is he who considers the poor, the Lord will deliver him from his trouble. Now, I want to ask the first question as we go back to Matthew chapter 5 and verse 7. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. What is mercy? Mercy is the Greek word for compassion. You'll always find mercy preceded by the word grace in the Bible. Grace and mercy. And we always realize that in order to have mercy, we have to first have experienced the grace of God in salvation. So when we come to our text, we're dealing with a person who has truly experienced the Lord's salvation and is a true believer. Whereas when we go to our other text, we'll see a counterfeit so-called Christian. Now, I want you to look at that and answer a question, what is mercy? And we realize that mercy is really God's forgiveness of our sins. In Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 10 or verse 12, it says, I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and iniquities I will remember no more. It is only of the Lord's mercy that our sins can be forgiven. Now, when we think about mercy, we to understand it, we have to see how it is related to God, how mercy and God are in relationship. For instance, in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 4, we see that God is rich in mercy, but God who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us. So God loves us and then bestows his mercy upon us. Christ is merciful. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 17, he's called a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God. Mercy is seen in our salvation in Titus chapter 3 and verse 5, where we're told not by works of righteousness or self-righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy he has saved us. Salvation is of the mercy of God, not of our works. And we see that mercy is also related to prayer. The ministry of prayer, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16 says, Let us come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. We also realize that mercy is related to future things in prophecy. In Jude 21, it says, Keep yourself in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. The idea, the concept that Jude is putting out is that there's going to come a time of tribulation and judgment, and then the Lord will return and judge the earth. But God is merciful, and he'll take the believer away in the rapture before that takes place. 
That is the mercy, the rapture is pictured as the mercy of God in future Bible prophecy. So the verse tells us, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Well, how do I be merciful? How does a person become merciful? We have to realize that only a saved person can express true mercy in their lives. In the Greek text, it not only has the idea of compassion, but it has this concept, not simply possessed of pity, but actively compassionate. The world can have pity. The world can can feel sorry for people. In the world, sometimes that sorrow leads us to make great sacrifices. But when we are members of the family of God, there's a new compassion, an active compassion that should be active and activated in our life. Let's look at some ways that we express as believers true compassion, active compassion. We do it in Christian sympathy for those that are in need. Here's a person that is in sorrow. They've lost a loved one. And the compassion of the believer is to reach out and comfort that person with the comfort they have received in other ways from the Spirit of God. There are those that are in sickness, and our compassion leads us to help them and to to do things for them because we know they can't do things for themselves. And that compassion is actively invigorated in our lives toward those. There are those that are in need, and we sacrifice in order to meet those needs. The early church was that type of a church when they were persecuted, and many people lost their jobs because they became Christians. And what did they do? They shared what they had with those that lost everything. They took care of one another. That was the compassion, the mercy that they were bestowing on on each other. There's another way that it is done, and we we see that in the life of Onesphorus. In the book of 2 Timothy, Onesphorus is described in verses 16 and 18 by Paul. And here's what Paul says. He says, The Lord give mercy to the house of Onesphorus, for he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chain. But when he was in Rome, he sought me out diligently, and he found me. The Lord grant to him that he may find mercy of the Lord in that day. And how many things he's ministered unto me at Ephesus, you know very well. So here's a man, Onesphorus. Onesphorus had ministered to Paul in Ephesus and even some other places. And he, when Paul was in prison in Rome, he left Ephesus. He went there to find Paul and to help him and to minister to him and, and to meet his needs and to strengthen him and encourage him. And that is exactly what he did. And what does Paul say he's going to receive for doing that? He's going to receive God's mercy. Remember, blessed are the merciful, Onesphorus, for he shall obtain mercy. And that was Paul's uh, illustration of how that works in Christian sympathy for those in need. Sometimes it's by being a partaker in the affliction of somebody else. In the book of Job, verse uh, 14 of chapter 6, it says, To him that is afflicted, mercy should be shown from his friend. Now, Job realized he had three friends around him, but they weren't showing him much mercy. Here they looked at Job. They thought he was going to die. He's out there alone. He's got this black leprosy that has affected every area of his body, and uh, he, it's a type of cancer. And now he is, he is suffering greatly, and he, they think he's going to die, and they say, you know what your problem is, Job? You must have done a terrible sin. The reason you're sick, you did something bad. You sin. You know, that often sadly happens too many times where people think that the reason bad things are happening to good people is because they really weren't that good at all. They must have done something really bad. But we know the whole story of the book of Job, that Job, a righteous man before God, was put to the test by Satan. Satan was trying to defeat him and destroy him. And instead of recognizing that his friends started condemning him for all sorts of things that he had never done. Paul, they, they are called poor comforters, all of them, Job says. And that's not the way we comfort those in need. We reach out, we become a partaker of their suffering, we meet their needs. 
Or as Charlie said, you mow their grass, you fix their lock, you do these other things, and you help them out in their time of need. Well, also, we have to realize that those in affliction need somebody to come and care for them. Do you remember who the person was in the story of the Good Samaritan that came and helped the poor fellow that had been beaten up and robbed and left to die? The Lord puts it in these words, He that showed mercy. That was the true friend. That was the Good Samaritan. He who showed mercy. And the person who shows mercy is going to receive it back. But there is no greater compassion, active compassion in Scripture than the person who is seeking to win souls for the Lord Jesus Christ. The compassion for another person's soul. It's described in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 14 where it says, For the love of God constrains us. It motivates us. It it pushes us to be compassionate, to be actively compassionate in telling somebody else what Jesus Christ has done for us. You know, that's one of the great signs that you've really been born again, that you want to let somebody else know what God did in your life. I can remember when I was first saved. I, no one told me about soul winning. I didn't even know what the term was. I knew that I had received Christ as my Savior. I knew he had forgiven my sins. And so the very first thing I did when I got back in school in the fall was find my friend Peter and share the gospel with him and say, Peter, I want to tell you what God did for me this summer. And I was able to take the word of God and show Peter what I knew, very little I knew at that time, that Jesus had died for me and he died for Peter and that Peter could receive Christ as his Savior too. And there in our science lab and in our public school, I led Peter to the Lord. The first one. And you know, that is what God expects. He expects if we've received mercy, we're going to show mercy to somebody else. If we've received salvation, we're going to tell other people about the very God who saved us. There's also the blessing of God promised on the merciful. Not only here in our text, but in Psalm 18 verse 25 says, With the merciful you will show yourself merciful. I love the little hymn chorus that says, In loving kindness, Jesus came, my soul in mercy to reclaim. From the depths of sin and shame, in love he lifted me. That's the one who finds true mercy. And that's the one who is blessed of God here in the Beatitude in chapter 5. But let's go over to Matthew chapter 23, and we see quite the opposite. Here we see judgment. Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites. Then he calls them later on blind guides who strain at a gnat, that little bug that gets in your eye, and but will swallow a camel. You know, we live in a day and age when a lot of people are stuck on little things and they, they, they make a big thing out of little things, but then the big things don't seem to bother them. Big sins don't seem to be a matter anymore. We want to just get away from it all. And that's what these old Pharisees were doing. They had an outward show of religion. Notice what it, it, it what it shows. He says, for you make tithe of mint and anus and cumin. You've admitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These you ought to have done and not to leave the others undone. They had this outward show of religion. They gave a tithe, 10% of spices, which they must have raised on their windowsill or wherever it was. Mint, which was a sweet-smelling plant. The, the anus, which is a dill plant. And then cumin, which is another seasoning. They, they would tithe that. They would give uh, one-tenth of those little herbs to, to the temple and say, I've done my job. Look, look how good I am. Look how religious I am. Look at what I'm giving. I'm tithing on the little things. And then they admitted the, omitted the most important things. The word omit here means to leave it, to abandon it, to forsake it. They were abandoning the major truths of the law. And there are three of them that were listed here. Judgment, mercy, and faith. Now let's look at those. Judgment is the idea of a decision based upon discernment. I have a discernment of what is right and wrong. There's no questionable thing. It's either right or wrong in certain matters. And I have to make a deliberate judgment about 
things that are right or wrong. And literally it has the idea of coming to a judgment that condemns sin. We live in a day and age when sin is not condemned anymore. In fact, there are many churches that sort of seek, that want to make uh, people very happy. So they don't talk about hell. They don't talk about the fact that after a person dies, there's judgment. They don't want to mention those things because it might offend them and might make them unhappy. But I'll tell you, if we don't tell a sinner that he's lost, he'll never get found. If we don't tell him that he is, he has a sin, that he has a sin nature that God hates, then he'll never be able to find forgiveness. There's sometimes we, we look at certain lifestyles and we, we sort of condemn the lifestyle and, and sometimes we condemn the sinner along with the lifestyle. But God loves the sinner, but he hates his sin. And he expects us to do the same thing. Not to condone sin, but to, to bring true judgment as what is right, what is wrong, what is biblical, what is not. They didn't have anything to do with that. In fact, the next thing, they, they didn't have mercy. Here, the word mercy means a love for people to show God's type of love, to show that God loves people, to have a heart that would respond to their needs, to have a heart of compassion, to have a, a soul and in compassion. These old Pharisees didn't have that. They were religious people, but they didn't really care what other people were doing. In fact, we learned earlier that they were actually robbing the widows of their inheritance, and, and they were cheating them out of it. So these guys were not showing mercy at all. And faith, faith is that spiritual conviction based on the word of God. In the Old Testament, there's one verse that ties all three of these together. It's Micah chapter 6 and verse 8. He has shown you, O man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you? Here, What are God's requirements? To do justly, in other words, judgment. To love mercy, the second word there, mercy. And to walk humbly with your God, that is faith. You see, they they neglected all of that. In Hosea chapter 6 and verse 6, God says, I desired mercy and not sacrifice, the knowledge of God more than the burnt offerings. Well, here were these religious people. They were making their sacrifices of their mints, but not doing anything about what they really needed to do for God. They, They kept that for themselves. They were running their own lives. They were thinking their works would save them and their works would get them to heaven. That their relig- being just being religious would, would satisfy God. God said, that's not what I want. I want you surrendered to me. In Matthew chapter 9 and verse 13, it says, go and learn what it means. I will have mercy and not sacrifice. And then it goes on to say this, for I am not come to call the sinners, the self-righteous, but sinners to repentance. In other words, Jesus is saying, my mission on earth is to save sinners. Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. He came as a shepherd to gather the sheep to himself. And if we're going to be showing mercy, that's exactly what we need to be doing as well. So who is the person who, whom, to whom God will direct his mercy the most? Well, the answer is found back in the psalm. In Psalm 41 and verse 1, Blessed is he that considers the poor. The Lord will deliver him in time of trouble. Now, what is he talking about? Just the poor person, any poor person? Well, the word poor here is an interesting word because it's in, in the Hebrew, it is a singular tense. And it means one poor person a particular individual. Uh, Dr. Gill says that that's one poor man, one person that you know that has a need, and you see that need, and you do something about it. There are a lot of people who say, well, I love all the poor people. I, I, I'll give to this organization that, but they never do anything individually to help a person that's in need. But here's a person who sees another person in need, and he does something. He has compassion. He has mercy, active compassion toward that person. How do you react to a person who would walk into church and they would have ripped and torn clothes? You knew that their clothes were old and and they probably hadn't been washed for a long while. They smelled. And you say, boy, I'm not going to sit near that person. 
In the book of James, the second chapter, it just talks about this, that there were people that came in very poor and, and, uh, and were not treated well in the church. They were not given the, the best seat. I can remember one day in Chattanooga, Tennessee, at the end of a service, uh, this very poor lady came forward. Uh, her clothes were dirty and filthy, and and a, a lady got up out of the church, and she had on her fancy clothes and her her fancy coat, and she came and put her arm around that lady and took her Bible and showed her from God's Word how she could be saved. That's compassion. That's reaching out to that one poor person. That's what the psalmist is talking about. So how do you react to that person? Let me tell you a story about Jimmy Campbell. Jimmy Campbell was the butler to the Queen of England. He had had all the special training any butler of England could have, but he was the Queen's personal butler. He was the one who set her clothes out at night so she'd be ready in the morning. He was the one who brought her tea. He's the one who turned down her her bed. He was there to help her any time she rang her bell. And he was the queen's butler. After a while, he got transferred to Washington, D.C. to be a butler at the British Embassy in Washington. And there he got very disillusioned as he saw all the sin abounding around him and how people were were just so so terribly wicked. And one day he took his white gloves and he threw them down and he walked out of the British Embassy and he said, I'm not doing this anymore. He didn't even know where he was going. He walked on the streets of Washington, D.C., which was probably a dangerous thing to do at that time anyway. But then he heard some singing, and he followed the sound, and he came to this building, and he walked in this building, and he said the first thing he did was to look around and see all these dirty people. He was in a gospel mission. He had never seen anything like that in his life. But the sound of the music The singing of those hymns impressed him and he took a seat and sat down and listened as the preacher got up and shared the gospel message. At the end of the service, he went up to that preacher and said, I need Jesus Christ as my Savior. Now, he didn't look like anybody else in that audience. He still had on his his butler clothes and he was all distinguished. And uh, that man, that preacher led him to the Lord. And then he realized that that Jimmy needs to be discipled. So he he sent Jimmy Campbell up to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, to the Sunday Breakfast Association, where his brother was the director of that mission. And Jimmy became an assistant. And he started ministering to these men that were coming in dirty and filthy and, and smelly and everything else, but he loved them. He had compassion because God had had compassion on his soul. And Jimmy started reaching out to them. Eventually, Jimmy became the director of the Sunday Breakfast Association, the largest gospel mission in Philadelphia. And he served the Lord faithfully in reaching these people for Christ. Oh, what a change came because he had true compassion. He had received mercy from God and he gave that mercy back to others. If we look in this chapter, we see a prayer for mercy in verse 4. Lord, be merciful to me. Heal my soul, for I have sinned against you. The first prayer in this psalm is a prayer for receiving Christ as Savior, to find the mercy of God, to find God's salvation, crying out to God saying, Lord, I'm a sinner. It's just like the man in Jesus' parable who came into the temple and said, Lord, be merciful to me, the sinner. And he cried out for salvation. He cried to have his soul forgiven and to be spiritually healed. But then you come down to verse 10, and it has another prayer. O Lord, be merciful to me. Raise me up that I might requite them. By this I know that you favor, have mercy on me, because my enemy does not triumph over me. Now let's picture the fact this person has received Christ as his Savior. Now he's praying that God's mercy will give him victory over the temptations and testings of life. He needs God's strength to overcome the temptation of the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. He needs God to give him the victory that only comes by a surrendered life to Christ. 
And he beseeches God in such a way to bestow such mercy on him that he would live a victorious life for Christ. And then we see that how that blessing is brought by God. At the end of the chapter in verse 13, it says, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel from everlasting to everlasting. Amen and amen. You see, he experienced the blessing. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. I may have shared this story briefly last week, but let me tell it a little more in detail. During the Korean War, the North Koreans came and invaded a city in South Korea. And they took some of the leaders of that city and, and killed them because they were the political leaders and the, and the religious leaders of the community. One man was slated to be shot. He was condemned to die, a Christian gentleman. And he was about to be shot when a, the communist, young communist soldier leader of that group that was there realized that this man took care of an orphanage in that town. And so he said, because you take care of the orphans, I'm going to have mercy on you. And I'm going to not kill you. So you can stay and kill, you can take care of the orphans. But I am going to have to kill your son in your place. And so he took his 19-year-old son, brought him before the firing squad, and had him killed in the father's eyes. Well, it wasn't too long after the war was over that this communist soldier from the north was captured and he was put on trial and he was condemned to die for war atrocities. And this, this man who had lost his 19 year old son came to the trial. When he heard the verdict, he pleaded with the judge that the judge would give him that man and not kill him. He said to the judge, let me take him, give him to me, and I will train him. Because he was young, he didn't really know what he was doing. And so the Christian man from the orphanage had mercy. And God did a great thing because as that father trained the man who had killed his son, trained him in the word of God, showed him that Jesus Christ loved him, not only did that communist soldier received Christ as his personal savior, but he surrendered his life to Christ and was a, became a preacher in South Korea. That is the mercy of God. Blessed is he that is merciful, for he shall obtain mercy. Mercy there was great, and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied for me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. If you've been to Calvary and found Jesus as your Savior, you can praise the Lord today. If you haven't, Pastor 6-2 and I would love the opportunity after this service is over just to sit down with our Bibles and show you from God's Word how you too can have your forgiveness of sin because of the mercy and grace of God. Let's pray. Father in heaven, help us to understand the truth of the mercy of God your forgiveness, your love, your grace. Oh God, you're such a wonderful God to pardon our iniquities and remember our sins no more because of the finished work of Christ on the cross. Help us to honor him on this Father's Day. Help us to see our Heavenly Father's love in sending his own Son, the Lord Jesus, to die for us that we might have eternal life if we would simply believe. We'll give you the glory in Jesus' name. Amen.